Hey, let's sing this song and y'all shake a hand and hug and at you. Uh, you've already done that. All right, here we go. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King, and I love you with the love of the Lord. Okay. Hey, let's do something. Let's tell Jesus we love him this morning, okay? All right. Hey, Lord, thank you. Uh, you've allowed us to come back on this great Sunday morning today, and uh, we're going to thank you for allowing us to do that. And this morning, our pastor's going to stand up here in just a few minutes, and he's going to tell us all the great things that you have for us, Lord. And if you would, Lord, I pray right now that you'll bless him, that you'll give him every word that I need to hear and that we need to hear, Lord, that when we leave this place today, Lord, we can be equipped and we can go out and share it with somebody else, Lord, that needs to hear your word. So thank you for doing that in advance. And, and Lord, also we got a lot of folks that was called out this morning in our Sunday school class that um, need some help. And uh, so we're going to ask you, if you would, to touch these lives, Lord, in whatever capacity, Lord, that you see fit to do, Lord, and help them. So thank you for doing that today. But again, today we're going to tell you this, Lord, that we love you. And I ask if you would that you would just go with us today and uh, just help us to open our hearts to you and, and uh, just let us just bask in your sunshine, Lord. But we love you, and uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Did anybody lose the key? It fits a vault that holds $50,000. Everybody. <laughs> no, no, he put it back in his pocket. <laughs> By the way, I'm not sure. It looks like an automobile key. And it has uh, Curtis on it. Curtis, is it yours? But it's a Chrysler product key. So, anyway, if you've lost it, be sure to let us, let us know it's sitting here. Good morning again. It's good to have you back. Uh, it's good to have you. If you've been away in any length of time, it's good to have you back. And if you've been away since Sunday, it's good to have you back. And praying that God will encourage you today as we come together. I have a lot of people that are going through difficult times this morning and really, really need a lot of prayer. Um, quickly, let me say, if you're visiting with us this morning, that you are our special guest. And we pray that God will encourage you as you come and uh, get under the Word of God, and maybe, and if you haven't, someone hasn't spoken to you this morning since you came in, then I apologize for the church, and hopefully that we'll get you before you get out, and let you know that you are important to us, and that uh, important to God, that's the one that's main, so you know that, and then if you are visiting, we'd like to give you a visitor's card, and then when you exit the building, um, if you would, take that card and drop it over in the offering place, which will be in the vestibule sitting on the table there. We'll have a record of your visit, and we do cherish your information. It will not go out um, out of this building. We will keep it here. So you, can you hear me okay out there? That's good. I don't, I don't want to hear me back here. So thank you. We're having trouble getting our sound system together. It had one of those. It had a heart attack yesterday. During the, <laughs> during the service. By the way, do remember to pray. As you well know, Sister Katrina Whitehead went home to be with the Lord this past week. And her family, which have suffered two great losses in, in less than four months. Um, pray for them and pray that God will encourage them and lift them up to the Lord. And then don't forget, uh, be back, of course, with us tonight, if you will. And we'll be having our regular 6 o'clock service. And I think that next Sunday is a special day. What, what's, what's going on next Sunday? Huh? Oh, that's what it is. 
Mother's Day. Isn't that a great day? Somebody say amen. amen. Yes, sir. Thank God for mamas. Someone said, well, what's so great about that? You are. Hallelujah. wasn't for mamas and daddies, it wouldn't be any us's. So, by the way, if your mother is still alive, and I'm serious, please, please do your best to spend time with her if possible. And if you're not where she is, then do your best to call her or make some kind of contact. And I've, I had a lady tell me the other day, said, well, I'm not very close to my mother. This would be a good day to get closer. You know, say, well, I've, I've tried. Try again. You know, if you keep on trying, maybe you'll succeed. And if you don't, at least you'll know you're doing the best you can. And so remember to pray for mothers. Thank God for godly mothers and godly fathers. I appreciate those that have paid the price of being a godly mother. Today, if you're a godly mother, you're, you're an unusual find in America. And we thank God for you. So remember to pray for our mothers. We'll be back. By the way, there will not be a Sunday evening service next Sunday. We will have Sunday school and we'll have our regular Sunday morning service. And uh, then we'll hopefully give you that afternoon so you can spend some time with your mother. Also, let me announce that, of course, don't forget to be back Monday evening here with Connie, our Bible study, ladies' Bible study at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. And then another couple of things. And uh, in June the 1st, of course, Men and Women's Adult Prayer Breakfast will be held, and we certainly encourage you to come. It's at 8.30. Of course, uh, we're a month off, but we'll keep you informed. And also uh, have a couple of things that we need you to know about. On May the 31st, we're going to have a men's meeting here at the church, just kind of an informal thing, a get-together, kind of a grill-out and cook out and enjoy each other, get to know each other a little bit better. It'll be here at the church on May the 31st, so don't forget that. We'll try to keep you informed. Um, ladies have meetings. I figure we need to have a meeting if we don't do nothing but meet. We can say, we had a meeting. Every time I say that word, I'm reminded of the corporate world, and I get sick at my stomach. They have a meeting to decide if they're going to have a meeting. Anyway, enough editorial on that. Also, I, this past week, I apologize for the people who did not get the notice that we're not having Wednesday night service because of the inclement weather, the difficult weather that had been forecast. In fact, I even called the uh, forecaster and I said, keep people off the road if you can. Here's why this is important. I need your phone number. If you desire to be on what we call the robocall, we have a system where I make one phone call and it goes to everybody's phone that desires it to come to you. Any pertinent information, any emergency information, uh, anything that we need to get out in a hurry to all that are on that call. There will be a list, uh, just a piece of paper out front on the vestibule. Please give me your most accessible number if you turn your phone off during the evening, your, your cell phone, and you have a home phone, give me both. And we'd like to get those numbers on the list so that we can get a hold of you if we need to. And uh, I knew I, I was concerned about Brother Laurie and, and his wife, Brother Laurie and his wife, because I knew that usually Wednesday night they were here and they were the, one of the only ones that I could think of that we didn't have their phone number. So... We addressed that issue this morning, didn't we, brother? Amen. So we're going to be on there, so he won't be standing. By the way, he and Beverly had a wonderful church service here at 7 o'clock by themselves. <laughs> oh, well. So do remember to do that when you leave the building this morning, and don't forget to continue to pray one for another. We'll be starting a, the introduction to a series this morning that has to do with the church. And I'm convinced that is one of the most important things that God's ever laid on my heart. And the reason for this is, uh, we have such such a wide, um, I guess, supplicative kind of thing in our mind about what church is and what church does, what makes up the church, and how the church, what the church should or shouldn't do, or those kind of things. And maybe we can elaborate a little bit that'll help clear up some understanding. But here's why, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we already are in a crisis. But we're heading for one that I perceive to be a great deal deeper. And I want to do my very best by the help of God to help prepare the people that are here to learn how to survive in a crisis, biblically. I'm not talking about food hoarding or any of that. I'm talking about a biblical perspective or what we're to do as a church and what we're to do as Christians. And it doesn't have to do with lamb blasting anybody. It has to do with allowing God to address in our lives what we need to do. So praying that God will help us understand this and move us forward as we get a better understanding. And uh, I can tell you this, if you expect things to be tomorrow like they've been today, you're going to be disappointed. You need to be prepared for whatever happens. So 
And I'm not talking about a doomsdayism kind of thing. I'm talking about just preparation for everyday life. So be here if you can. Uh, we're looking like maybe we'll have anywhere from six to eight messages if it'll be on Sunday morning only. So we'll try to reserve those for those that are coming on Sunday morning. Don't forget, be back with us, and we're looking forward to a great day. Don't forget all the choir practices and all the things that are here, and we're looking forward. If you are visiting, would you just slip up your hand and let us give you a visitor's card? Anybody visiting this morning? I didn't think I saw anybody, but it may have. Uh, yes, son. you You're visiting? I'm in real trouble if she's visiting. There's got to be one smart aleck, and I asked her to be it this morning. <laughs> okay, let's remember to continue to pray. We do have, yes, ma'am. Senior Saints meeting will be May the 20th, Tuesday. By the way, if you'll pick a bulletin up, you'll have all this information with you at all times, and we'd love to keep that up too. But don't forget, we have a quick prayer meeting for our brother. Brother Mark uh, is not here this morning. He's in, he's in the hospital, Brother Mark Herring. He has diverticulitis and, and a stomach infection. Do remember to pray for him. Brother uh, Harmon uh, Sumner has been taken back to the hospital. He had a stroke earlier this week, thought everything was fine, carried him home, had to rush him back to the hospital this morning with severe headaches. So do remember to pray for him. And uh, I know there's a lot of others that we need to pray for, but those are specifics. If you will, remember to pray for Brother Bill and, uh, and Reggie Lewis um, going through all kind of battle with his liver cancer and stuff. So do remember to hold them up to the Lord. Okay, gentlemen, if you want to come and receive the offering, I appreciate it. All right. How about standing back up with me again? And uh, I think you're going to like these songs today. <clears throat> I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, and the white Is your name written down? Amen. 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 It's written down.
glad that he did Mm -mm -mm. because he lives
How many believe that he's alive? Amen. I don't have any doubt this morning that the songs that Brother Tony chose were inspired of the Lord because they're so complimentary to the message that God's given us. Especially the one that talks about, I know he lives and I can face uncertain days because he lives. Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what tomorrow brings. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And that's what we need to be aware of today. By the way, 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 1, verse 1 and following. So 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1 and following. Mother's Day, we'll be doing as we normally do. There'll be a table set up on the side. And if your mother's already deceased, gone to heaven, and you'd like to bring a, a picture of your mother, or if she uh, doesn't live here, lives somewhere else, and you'd like to be reminded of and, and prayed for her, then uh, we'd like to have our picture displayed if you care to uh, here on the table. And we will be celebrating Mother's Day. Paul is writing to a church that he's already spent a great deal of time with. He founded this church back somewhere about 54, 55 A.D. And this letter is his second offering to that church. Remember, he wrote the church of 1 Corinthians when he wrote that letter. It was a letter of correction. It was a letter of discipline. It was a letter of doctrinal correctness. And today what we're finding is this is more of a personal letter uh, from Paul. It seems more personal than even all the rest of his epistles because it addresses some real personal issues uh, for the believers and also some personal encouragement. And this chapter 1 has is, is always fascinated me because of uh, the context. But I think that in lieu of the, the uh, looking at the church as a whole, I can't think of a chapter that probably is more appropriate for us to, be, to launch our series on than, than this one. In fact, I spoke on a part of this uh, yesterday at the funeral because it's so apropos when it, when it deals with individuals. And by the way, the church is made up of individuals. The church is not some conglomerate that's an, or, an, an invisible organization. In fact, it's a very visible organism. And it's made up of human beings that have been born again, been uh, changed by the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiven of our sins. doesn't make us anybody special, but it makes the one that made us somebody special. And so we're here to exalt our King and also to encourage the people of God and to challenge us. Many times in the act of encouragement, we're always challenged because the Word of God doesn't separate the two. Many times we are corrected in order to be uh, encouraged. So the two run hand in hand. So as it will, I'm going to read down all the way through verse 12 and then we'll back up and make some comments. So if you'll give me your attention, please. Paul, an apostle, verse 1, chapter 1 of Jesus Christ. By the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Acacia, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul always, this is sort of a common introductory form that Paul uses because he always speaks of grace, and that's God giving us what we can't deserve, and that the results of grace is always peace. And when we understand our relationship with God because of His amazing grace, then we have peace with God. You can't have peace with God until you're at peace with God. And that's what grace does. It establishes that divine connection. And then in verse 3, he says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives him two titles that are so dear to me. He calls him the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Mercy and comfort. What about that, guys? Isn't that enough to preach on until Jesus comes? Just those two elements of our wonderful Lord. And then in verse 4, he says, This God who comforteth us in all our tribulations or our difficulties, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. It sounds like a lot of double talk to you spend a little time realizing he's talking about the multiplication principle. Whatever he puts in us, we share with others, and others share with others, and others share with others. That's the gospel principle of getting the gospel. Now, and any other need that the church might have. But he's writing to the church now. He's writing to the ecclesia. Those called out ones. That group of people that is universal and yet local. And he says this in verse 5. He said, For... As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. The sufferings of Christ create sufferings for those who 
tend to cling to our Christ. And then yet, the comfort that he received from his Father, we received from him. And verse 6 is, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, using the analogy of Jesus being afflicted for our comfort. He's saying, if we, the apostles, are afflicted for any particular reason, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual, another word for fervent, in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast. How long has it been since someone addressed you and said, you know what, I have all confidence in the world with you. You're going to stand fast in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be an encouraging thought? Uh, by the way, you'd say, well, I, I'm not too sure it would be accurate. Well, we can make it accurate. Just stand fast. And so he's saying, I, I want to encourage you that steadfast. And my encouragement of you is steadfastness. And he said in verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant or unlearned of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measures above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of our life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, you also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversations or our behavior in the world and more abundantly to you, Word. Paul has done so much in this just first few verses, I'm sure, that when it was read to the church of Corinth, that they were ex excited about the fact that Paul were doing two things. He was preparing them on how to survive in a crisis. How do you survive in a, in a crisis where the world seems to be the enemy of, of the church of Jesus Christ? And that was the world that they were living in. Remember, the church was a new thing at this particular time. We're talking about 54, 55 A.D. The church was only like 20-something years old at this time. And a very new doctrine floating, a hated doctrine by the Jew and a hated doctrine by the idolaters. So Paul was writing to say, listen, in the middle of the conflict, when things get tough, the tough get going. Amen? Amen. So he was saying, guys, you're going to get some difficulty. We're going to get some difficulty. But I want to give you some hints on how to survive. And by the way, who better, who better to give us information on how to survive in a crisis like Paul the Apostle, who himself survived continuously in that state. I want to point out just a couple of things that maybe will do something to help us. And if we look down in verse 9, I believe he'll pick up this. He says, first of all, we need to let you know that we had the sentence of death in us. Now, what does that mean? That simply means two things. Number one, we were ready to die for Jesus Christ. We understood when we took up the cross that the cross is an emblem of death. Today we think of the cross as an emblem of life, and it is that in one sense, but the cross, unless there's a death, there's no opportunity for life, and that death was Jesus Christ. And the carrying of the gospel still demands, how many know that, We've been taught over and over. You need to be a witness for Christ. How many have heard that? And we've heard it over and over. And by the way, it's absolutely correct. The problem is we don't understand what the word witness means. The word witness comes from the Greek word martyrs. Here's what it means. Martyrs. There will be a martyr for Jesus Christ. In other words, we're willing, when we take up his cross, we're willing to say we'll suffer unto death. And use that analogy doesn't mean, hopefully, that we may not die in the heat of battle uh, standing up for the word of Jesus Christ. But I can tell you this is happening all over our world this morning while we're here. People that are dying because of holding up the cross. And so he was telling them, we have, by the way, you know how to stop fear of your life? Give it away. That's what he did. He had given away his life to Jesus Christ. And so he says, I want to tell you up front that if you want to prepare to survive in a crisis, make your life 
His life, in His control, in His comfort, in His protection. And guess what? Whatever happens, God will either allow to happen or cause to happen, and you can just rest and get it done. Somebody say amen. I don't know about you, but that thrills me. You know what? We have such a half-hearted idea about commitment to Christ today that it's, it's, it's that lukewarm. I know we're in that, we're in that lukewarm stage. We're in the, in the Laodicean church age when there's just not very much commitment going on, not only in church, but in marriage and relationships and commit financial commitments. All of it has just become, it's what we're in tune with. But wait a minute. We don't have to be a part of that. Say amen. We do not have to be a part of that. And Paul is saying, the sentence of death created in us a desire to live. And that living that life under the protective hand of Almighty God. How many know that God's still alive? Amen. Well, then why do we run around shaking about, you know, we're, we're, oh my goodness, this is going to happen. This gas is going up. Well, hey, walking's not crowded. I'm sorry, I don't want to do a lot of that. But I mean, goodness, please, I don't want to minimize financial crisis, but there's things more important, is what we're saying. And Paul says, the first thing that I need to do is know not to trust in myself. See what he said? He said that we had, we absolutely had the sentence of death in our eye, in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves. American people, is, it's really hard for American Christians to get a hold of this, because we've always been taught, listen, you're responsible for yourself. And to some degree, thank God, I wish we'd get back to that in some sense. But the other side of that is, when we become a Christian, not only are we responsible for our actions, we have a God that's responsible for our protection. It's not the government that protects us. It's not our ability to arm ourselves. It's not our ability to do all these things. It's this. It's the fact that I don't trust in me. And if you trust in you, you're in for a big disappointment. How many already know that? But if we trust in Him, and that's how to survive in a crisis. The things that are happening, I know I, I shared with you earlier, when I was in Kenya, and we went down into it right outside of Nairobi, when we went down into the, to the, to the village, they call it, which is 170,000 strong of, of slums that I would have never possibly could have conceived in my mind had I not been there and saw the sewer running down the streets, people living in, in shantytown, if you'd call it even worse, kids playing on trash piles, that was their playgrounds they were playing with, and, and the stench was, was horrible, but the, here's, the, here's the thing that was so, I have never met a more joyous bunch of Christians. Absolutely. And we gave Bibles. And I wish you could have seen the eyes of those men. Some of you saw uh, in, the, in the film that we brought back, what little we were able to get back, at how when we gave them a Bible, they grabbed it and held it like it was the most prized possession they had. I wept like a baby. I couldn't pre. I told, I told Michael, a uh, missionary I was with us, said, you, you got to start this thing off. I, I'm, I'm, give, me, give me a while to get a hold of this thing. In America, we take all these things for granted. And it's not a for granted thing. It's a blessing thing. God gave us this right and this freedom to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we're charged with. And by the way, we start with our community. We start with Highway 20. Amen. I know, I love Highway 20. You know why? We got sinners out here. I think we got some everywhere. But we got, <laughs> when we came out here, I couldn't understand. There were two crack houses behind us over here. And I said, Lord, what in the world? There's enough churches here to take Tallahassee by storm. What do we need to be here for? I don't know, but we're still here. Here's what I do know. I know the message of Jesus Christ is relevant anywhere we take it, but we can't trust that we can do it. We have to bet on the fact that God does it. And so we take that, and he says, first of all, guys, I know you've been through some tough times, but quit trusting in yourself. This idea, and this is what's happened in, in the latter part of our century when we see this thing called humanism that's beginning to creep back into Christianity, and it's all about the man. It's all about the man. No, it isn't. It's all about the man that made the man. His name is Jesus. So he said, don't trust in yourself if you want to survive. You will not make it on your own. Amen? That sounds like a death nail, and it is. And he continues, and he said, we found out. We could not trust in ourselves. But in God, which raised the dead. You know what he just said? Even if they kill us, the one thing they can't do, they can't keep us dead. I love that. <laughs> Amen. Now look, I'm not going to run out and catch the next hearse going to the funeral home. 
But here's the one thing that I know. If they do, I won't be there. They'll just take my shell. That's what he's saying. You can't kill what's inside of you. It's the living God that's going to be living on. And if you keep that kind of attitude, no, I'm not talking about do dumb things. I mean, we, we can do a lot of dumb things and say, well, I trust God. We better be careful putting mouth and words in God's mouth. The only thing He promised us is what He recorded in this book. So don't be, don't be making God responsible for some of the dumb things. Oh, I'm going to go buy this car. God will pay for it. If you buy it and don't ask God, you pay for it. I've had some of that. Say amen. Listen to this now. When he continues and he says, Don't trust in yourselves, but trust in God even unto death. Even unto death. Even unto bankruptcy. Even unto as terrible as that is. Even unto losing all the things I have. I think about Paul who left his family. Paul could write very truthful about how all of a sudden his life was bound up in one person. And that person was Jesus Christ. Paul was not anti-family. But he's saying anything that you take into your life, you make sure you take them into God's life with you. That's why a husband and wife are supposed to be one. And we're one in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to get into that a little bit. By the way, I believe marriage is still a very honorable and precious thing. Somebody say amen. I don't believe it's something to be joked about. I, don't th I think it's one, of the mo it's one of God's institutions. He instituted, he instituted marriage. He instituted government. He instituted the church of Jesus Christ. And we need to get back to taking anything we take into our life must belong to God Himself. And that way you have nothing to lose. How do you like that? Someone asked me one time, well, how in the world, what did those people do when Paul came into town? You couldn't do anything. Well, you can't do anything with a man who's already consigned himself to death. He says, I tell you what we're going to do, Paul. We're going to lock you up and throw away the key. He said, that's all right to live as Christ. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. We'll just take you out and kill you. He said, man, that's even better. Go for it. I mean, what are you going to do to a guy like that? That's what Paul is sharing with us. When all of a sudden our centrality changes, when it's not us in the middle, it's him in the middle, it'll change the way we look at things. So he's saying, church, get away from trusting yourself. Also trust him totally unto death. And then I love this. He continued in verse 10. He talks about what this God does who, who when you take in Him in your life and He is your life. He said, He, verse 10, who delivereth us from a great death. And by the way, He's speaking about the past tense of being delivered through salvation. He's talking about the word great there in first eternal. You and I cannot die eternal if we're Christians. Amen. In fact, if you look in the Scripture, everywhere that a Christian died, the word death isn't mentioned. The word sleep is mentioned. Now, he's talk, not talking about soul sleep as a doctrine. He's talking about the fact that we go into, into a circumstance where we just, we just change. We go, what we do is go to sleep and wake up, by the way, all in one sixty-four one hundredth of a second. Well, that's what they say a batting of an eye is. I've told you before, I believe it's fast. That's what Richard Petty said is fast. Amen. So it's going to happen so quickly that life has changed. And he said, we've been delivered. And by the way, that is actually in the future tense. It means not only have we been delivered, but we're always delivered. We can't go back past that point of salvation. How many are glad that we're saved forever? By the way, if you weren't, you'd be hunting the altar every church service. I need to get saved again. No, thank God if you get it right now. By the way, that's no excuse to sin. If you really belong to God, God will he'll put you in a place that you don't want to be, but He's just like a good daddy. He'll take you out and chasten you. Till you'll be glad to walk right. Amen? That's what He does because He loves us. And then He said He doth deliver. That means He's in the process of continuing to deliver us. Not from salvation. I mean the death from the cross. He's continuing to deliver us every day. Let me ask you a question. You ever think about the providence of God? How many times this week did God deliver you and you had no idea He was doing it? You were driving down the road texting. I know nobody in here does that, right? Oh, okay, we'll get on past that. But let's suppose you're just riding down the road and all of a sudden you look up and there's a car right in front of you and you had just enough time to stop. What do you think caused you to look up? All these things that happen, we just take them for granted and say, oh man, I sure was lucky today. No, you didn't. He's in the delivering process. He's 